and you stay in that career and you move your trajectory and you keep getting promoted, promoted, promoted. Maybe you start to go to school. Maybe you take some time out to have a family. But ultimately, the goal is to work until you retire and then you enjoy life. Um, and for many people, especially my parents' generation, that was a very straight trajectory. You got your job, you stayed there 20, 30 years, maybe 40. You retired with a pension, you get your social security, and bada boom, bada bing, you're living your life, traveling the world like my parents do, although not anymore because of COVID. But for many of us, that's not really going to be the case. Uh, so here's, again, another show of hands. How many of you um, thought that you were going to maybe be a doctor or go to medical school? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of hands. I was that person too. I knew at a very early age, I'm gonna to go to medical school, I'm gonna be a doctor. And when I got to school, I realized that I was doing fine in the natural sciences. My grades were great. Um, I applied to medical school, I got in, but I realized that I wasn't having fun. And that's a really long time to be in school if you're not having fun. And what I realized is that where I was having fun were the classes that were more social sciences in nature, where I could bring in that analytic, that research, that uh, science background and component. So I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time telling you some of the things that I've done over the course of my career. So um, how many of you have heard, have heard of the National Academies of Science or the National Academy of Engineering? Show of hands. No? Okay. Well, there's the National Academies of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine, which are actually uh, quasi-governmental agencies out of the District of Columbia that are basically uh, governmentally funded think tanks. And what will happen is somebody in federal government will say, hey, we need research on this particular issue. And they will form a committee of experts from around the world who will look at this issue, they'll formulate a report, and then they present it out. So if any of you have ever taken a vitamin, or any kind of medication. There was actually, a, I used to work at the Food Nutrition Board. So if you, we had, we were the group that put out all of the recommended dietary allowances, right? So that was one of the things that, the, that we did or some of the types of research that you could find at the National Academies of Medicine. Um, earlier on in my career, I worked at a company called Inflection. That's this one here. And at Inflection, we also were federally funded through the National Institutes of Health. And we were basically a research-based company that looked at how do we utilize technology to change health behavior. So early, early on, I was just home on the Cape this summer and I found my, own, my old Palm Pilot. So that might make some people laugh since now everything is on our little iPhones. Um, but one of the projects that I worked on that was really uh, sort of cutting edge at the time was how could we use your handheld device? Sometimes they were phones and sometimes they weren't to help people maintain their medication regimen. So part of what we had to do is we had to do all the research to find out what kind of medications are people taking? What are the cycles that they are, they're on? What gets in the way of them taking their medication on time? And we developed all these algorithms. We did all this research. We crunched the numbers. And then we developed a tool that was digital, that was in their Palm Pilot, where it would give them these automatic reminders for when they needed to take their medication. Now you've got that in an Apple Watch. But 20 years ago, we didn't have such a thing. Um, over the course of my career, I've worked at the National Institutes of Health. So how many of you heard of Dr. Fauci? Everybody's hands should have gone up. How many of you heard, of, let's try this again. How many of you have heard of Dr. Fauci? There we go. So I actually worked at NIAD, which is Dr. Fauci's Institute, it's the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And that was an amazing job. When I was there, I actually was the person responsible for recruiting people for clinical trials. So we're looking right now to develop a vaccine for coronavirus. And I actually worked on the SARS vaccine, which is also a coronavirus. But in order to do this kind of work, you need to be able to understand the science. You need to be able to translate that science to the average person. You need to be able to speak to a particular audience to encourage them to participate. So the way we might have a conversation with someone who is African-American, given the atrocities that have happened to African-Americans historically in research, versus a Bethesda mom who perhaps has an MBA but doesn't work, very, very different conversation in terms of what would compel them to participate in a clinical trial. Um, eventually, uh, I worked at the Association of Public Health Laboratories, and while I was there, I worked in our global health department, so I spent about 10 years doing international HIV work, traveling all over everywhere. It was a really great job. 
Um, and APHL also received a lot of federal funding through the Global AIDS Program with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and then eventually I transitioned over to Ketchum. Now Ketchum compared to some of the other things in my portfolio looks a little bit different, but Ketchum is a top five public relations company or public relations firm. It's uh, federally publicly traded. And um, I worked in our two divisions in our policy division and in our social marketing practice. And these are the two groups that did a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies. We did a lot of work with nonprofit healthcare based organizations. And we did an awful lot of work with federal government. So how many of you remember when we transitioned to electronic health records? It was a big push nationally, globally, um, but in particular here in the United States to make that transition to national health, to uh, electronic health records and to communicate to the entire country why were we doing that? What was gonna happen? How, why is it important to you? Um, what are those changes? What does it mean for physicians in their offices? What does that mean for hospitals? How is workflow going to be changed or altered? All of these were the kinds of things that we, we were uh, commissioned to do um, through the federal government and that was like a $25 million account. That's where the business piece comes in. Any questions up till now? Anything in the chat that I need to consider? Okay, so I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time going through um, some of the work that I've done over the years. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides because it's lots of really cool uh, viruses. And um, when I think about global health, I, I've spent quite a number of years. I worked, um, as I shared previously, uh, in HIV. So I spent about 10 years uh, doing international HIV work, uh, traveling all over, um, helping to um, teach people about how you can use dry blood spots to um, test for whether or not people had HIV. We also did a lot of uh, tuberculosis work, which is another communicable disease in terms of trying to tamp down uh, outbursts and outbreaks in different parts of the world. Um, but most recently, I spent about five years while I was, while I was at NIAD um, under Dr. Fauci's group, working at the Vaccine Research Center and while we there, we there, as I shared earlier, my major job was to recruit people for clinical trials. Um, while I was there, we recruited for uh, two different Ebola studies. One of them was in Uganda, and I helped open a clinical trial overseas. Um, I also worked on the SARS vaccine, which at the time was our fastest enrolling study. Um, and the really interesting part about that, and one of the reasons why I love health communications and public health, is this is really sort of the intersection of the science with the communications. Um, because if you, again, if you don't understand the science, you can't translate it to a lay person or an average individual. You have to be able to understand what is a DNA plasmid. You have to be able to communicate how you develop a vaccine without any machinery. You have to be able to articulate to an individual audience that they're not gonna get sick because there's no live virus. And why is that the case? Um, and in particular, when we worked on the SARS vaccine, that sort of model is actually the model that they're now using for the current uh, coronavirus because both SARS and COVID are coronaviruses. Um, so that has been one of the highlights of my career, quite honestly. Um, I've spent a number of time, uh, uh, quite a bit of time on women's health and children's health care issues. I previously shared that my formal background in health in public health is maternal and child health. And um, how many of you know, I'm gonna ask you this question again, how many of you knew that up until about five years ago, you could get federally funded to do clinical research and you did not have to account for sex as a biological variable? Do you even know what that means? So when we say accounting for sex as biological variable, that means if you are doing research and you're getting federal dollars to do that, doesn't matter what the research is, that researchers did not have to look at male XY and female XX. So they could do all of their studies from, from literally the molecule on up, molecule to, uh, to uh, insects, to small animals, to large primates, up into human clinical trials. And they, there was no mandate that they needed to consider sex as a biological variable. So they could just do all of this research and report findings for male, which may or may not account for findings for female. 
That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yet up until about five years ago, that was the law. So this is the kind of thing that I've worked on. So when uh, the Office of Research on Women's Health, which is also an uh, office within the National Institutes of Health, um, we worked with them on how do they promote uh, this new regulation? How do we talk to scientists? How do we get to researchers? How do we get to junior researchers? How do we um, help them develop study uh, protocols and guidelines? How do you articulate that science such that you can be published? Because it's great if you pull the research, but if you don't ever analyze those results and then publish on it, then the fact that you've done it doesn't really mean anything. Um, so this is something that we do a lot in communications of the alliteration. So you need to consider the designs, you need to collect the data, you need to characterize what it says, and then you need to communicate it to the general population. Um, so these were some of the things that we did when I was at NIH the second time. Um, eventually, after all of this sort of uh, work I did, um, eventually I became the chief communications officer at a hospital in Washington, D.C. called Providence Hospital. That was a really interesting place because it was a Catholic hospital. So it was bound by Catholic directives um, in all assets of its care, but it was also very mission driven. And so a lot of the work that we did as a hospital um, was conducted without regard for whether a person had the ability to pay or not. So as a hospital, we actually lost about $22 million a year in uncompensated care. Um, but we served anybody and everybody who came through our doors. This video, I'll just show you quickly. Uh, as a chief communications officer, you should be able to hear. Let's talk about breast reconstructive video, surgery. That's so docs. important for any woman who's had a bout of breast, breast cancer. cancer. Tell us more. more. It is. So breast re reconstruction, every position. patient should be counseled about their options. So, so I'm just going to just give you an idea that part of what I was responsible for as a chief communications officer was not only finding opportunities to promote our services, but to develop the advertising, find opportunities to promote our doctors, to make sure that the community knew who they were. And especially given that we were not a for-profit hospital, we were a small Catholic-based hospital on the other side of town, to remind people that we were there and that we were in the community and that we were there to serve them. So I wanna spend just a minute talking about the intersections um, and why health communications is so important. Hold on one second. There we go. So one of the things that's so important about health communications is that it ultimately should lead to health literacy and health equity. And so if you think about it as looking at the, um, the, the image on the left, uh, we, those of us who are in health communications or public health communications, um, we are interested in the quality of care. We're interested in the equity. We want to make sure that through everything that we do, the patient or the audience, a lot of times it may not be a patient, but it might be the general population, really understands what's happening. We also work cross-platform, excuse me, with scientists who are potentially doing bench research. We might work with epidemiologists who are looking at the, um, the, a study of the occurrence of disease, especially right now with COVID. You see a lot of work being done with epidemiologists. Um, we might work with people who are developing personalized care, like some of the really fun and interesting work that's happening in cancer research with personalized medicine and things like that. Um, and the, the image on the right really just shows you how the World Health Organization uh, views health communications um, as making sure that it's accessible to all people, that it's actionable. So part of what we, we need to do is, again, it's if we're recruiting for a clinical trial, it's explaining it such that the person would feel compelled to volunteer to be in a study. Um, making sure that that information is credible, whether you're sending it to healthcare providers, the actual audience itself, um, government entities, so that people can make informed decisions about what to do next. Of course, making sure that the information is relevant to the communities that it's intending to serve. Um, it's timely. Um, we think about what's happening right now with COVID and how quickly can the researchers get the information out there and how quickly can we honestly and effectively disseminate that information to the masses and make sure that the information can be understood by whomever needs to hear it. 
Um, one of the things that I've, I'm doing right now in my doctoral program, one of my earlier assignments was to look at the code of ethics for healthcare communications. I was actually shocked to find that we don't have one. So in my pocket, I'm thinking that might be a dissertation project. So um, thinking again from the STEM perspective, you know, why might one of you consider a career in health communications? And for me, what I loved about it is that I was able to incorporate my interest in love of natural sciences along with my interest in love of, of the social sciences. And how do we combine those and communicate this information in a way that's really effective and important? And we always start off with the research. Um, the research is what gives us the basis. And so the research, you have to either look at it, analyze it, develop the research project in and of itself, um, and understand what the research is telling you. From there, you develop your insight. And what I consider the insight is sort of that aha moment. Uh, what is that one piece of information that you know will speak to a particular audience to compel them to move in one direction or another? Once you know what that insight is, then you can develop your strategy. And what that would include might be your overarching uh, plan, uh, looking at who are the two or three key audiences that you're trying to engage. What is the action that you want them to take? And how are you going to assess that action? How do you make sure that on the post end, when you're evaluating, you've got information that's measurable and you can determine whether or not your intervention was successful or not? And then finally, we get to the part that's where you develop your creative, whether that's your ad, your video, uh, your commercial, your print materials, your social media copy, your social media concepts. Um, all of those types of things that would be considered part of the creative materials that we would develop. So here's just an example of one of the campaigns that I created when I was at uh, NIAD with NIH, working at the Vaccine Research Center. And these, the two individuals here, this is Kimon Freeman, and here this is Sarah Jones. And these were actual volunteers who contributed and participated in clinical trials. Uh, Kimon actually is a local AIDS activist who is, as you can probably tell or guess, is African-American. And I spent probably two years of time working with him and talking with him and explaining to him the science and why it was important for people to volunteer. He was very, very anti-participating uh, in clinical trials. And he basically was like, well, convince me, Diane, convince me. And over the course of time and relationship, relationship building and attending the events that his organization would put on and sharing information with him about the science, he basically was like, okay, this is something I need to do and it's something I need to tell other people to do. Um, and the reason why this is such a big deal is because it might look like just a really pretty picture on screen, but these ads were on our metro system. So he would get on the train and he'd be sitting underneath his poster. He would go to the bus and see his poster at the bus station. Um, and Sarah Jones, um, actually, she was one of our other volunteers who was a military wife. Um, and she participated in the Ebola vaccine trial. And it was very important to her where every couple of years her family was being picked up and travel, traveling and being posted in different parts of the world. She felt it was really important for her to be part of that conversation as well. Um, this is just an example of a bunch of the media coverage we got over the course of time, in particular for our vaccine clinical trials. And so you can tell that it's very broad ranging. Um, we had a mobile clinic here. I helped launch our mobile clinic. Uh, we had lots of radio hits. We had ad, ads in Washington Blade, which is one of our LGBTQI um, organizations. Um, newspapers, Metro Weekly, the same thing. Howard Radio. Um, Howard University was a big um, partner of ours. Um, and so it's also thinking about once you've got these creative materials, how do you use them? Uh, where do you post them? And that's why knowing your audience and understanding what the end goal is, is really very important. So I spent a little bit of time talking about sort of the pure sciencey types of things. But I think one of the other things that I really enjoy about public health and health communications is that it gives us an opportunity to think about healthcare in a way that we might not have ordinarily thought of. So the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy was a client of mine for about 18 months. And they brought on a new CEO who really decided to address uh, adult literacy as a public health issue. Um, and her basic premise is that um, about 40%, depending on the numbers, of adults are either low literate or um, do not have enough literacy, as she says, to live their lives with dignity. 
And so when I was working with them, we did a couple of different things. This is an X Prize. Um, if any of you've heard of X Prize out of California, they do all kinds of things with sort of coming up with this idea that most people think can't be done and then making it happen. So if you think of the um, uh, monk at, no, I'm blanking on his name, Eli, Eli Musk, right? Elon Musk. He's got the spaceship that he just did on his own. That's what I'm talking about, the gazillionaire. Um, they, they're affiliated. So uh, what we did with Barbara Bush Foundation was they commissioned a $17 million award um, to uh, have a competition to help people utilize technology to help people learn how to read by eliminating the barrier of going into a program, something that you could literally do on your phone, sitting on the bus, waiting at your, for your kids in their soccer practice, whatever. And there were four teams that uh, made it to the finals and this codex was one of the ones that won. And they basically taught people how to read by using a gaming app. They developed a whole gaming app, the whole new world, whole new language and taught people how to read. And that was one of the projects I was involved in along with developing this, which is a literacy map, which we call the gap. So you see literacy deeply impacts health. And when we click on that, so 130 million Americans lack the proficiency in literacy. And so what we did with this map, and this was a project that I was very heavily involved in, was uh, mapping out uh, what happens and where by county level data, you can go all the way down here, right? And pick up what the levels are, 21% of adults in Nelson County, Virginia, versus 14% of adults um, in Natrone County, Wyoming. And then we looked at it verse based on different metrics. So what happens with literacy when you put language in there? What happens with literacy when you're looking at your health care? What happens with literacy when you're looking at income? So all of these were the types of things that we did um, to try to map literacy as a public health issue. And again, it's one of those things that you don't necessarily think about. Um, but this is again, that part of that intersection that I was mentioning earlier. Um, I talked a little bit about um, working at Providence Hospital, but some of the things that we were able to do that was a lot of fun. Um, we actually named our emergency department for the Pope, Pope Francis. Um, we were the first um, hospital in the country to make that type of request to have to go all the way up to the Vatican. And so some of the things I get to do as a health comes person is throw parties and organizing really great events to try and get lots of uh, media coverage. Um, some of the other things I've done is not as much fun as organizing an event, but it's still nonetheless important. So the image on the left was developing our annual report where we talked and again, sharing the information about what you do. And then if you look to the image on the right, we did a, uh, what we call the medical mission at home, where we went out into the community to offer free services to anybody who needed them through lots of partnership with uh, other organizations. Um, I've worked on programs looking at truancy prevention. And so why might truancy prevention be a public health issue? Well, when you are a young kid who can't read or write, you can't uh, understand uh, basic things for school, you might drop out, you might not graduate. Um, and we developed a campaign where we um, altered the truancy rates in the District of Columbia. Um, our campaign was what time, the, what, the what time is it tour? Uh, to encourage kids to get up and get to school on time every day. Um, we did school at pace to stay. That was one of the taglines that we came up with. And we did that by doing focus groups with the kids. Uh, we did focus group with children, parents, and teachers all over town to get their input on what would resonate. Um, so that's again where some of the, the research piece might come in uh, and the data and analysis because it doesn't do any good to come up with a campaign on your own if your target audience isn't going to be engaged. These people here, I'm not sure what's going on with my mouse here, but if you look at the middle image there, uh, those are five students from around the city whose teachers identified them as truancy uh, reformers. And we use them to do this really great campaign where we interviewed all of them, found out what they wanted to do, and then we worked with a local uh, artist to create this ad campaign again that was on the Metro bus, it was on the trains, it was in the bus shelters. Um, and we also did a couple of radio ads as well. Um, another company I worked with was a company called Afaxis. Again, I love the alliteration. Afaxis came from the literal terms affordable access is how they came up with the name Afaxis. Um, and Afaxis is a um, 
is a mission-driven, customer-focused pharmaceutical company that only deals in products for women. So if you remember, I shared that my area of focus was maternal and child health. So I've always been very interested and involved in the healthcare issues, in particular of women, children, and vulnerable populations. Um, and so with Afaxis, we literally help them uh, with their mission statement. We help them develop um, sort of their corporate ethos and communicate that to the community. We uh, did issues of crisis management because a lot of what they do is, is um, access to birth control. Um, and this project, which I thought is really cool, um, how many of you have heard of Tom's, right? You buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair of shoes, or Bamboo, I think, are, are ba the socks, where you buy a pair of socks and they give a pair of socks. So Project Ruby was another one of those projects. I'm not sure what's going on with my necklace. I was going to show you the video. So with Project Ruby, which was a project that we helped them launch, um, working with a couple of NGOs in Central and South America, we provided um, for every woman in the United States that uses a faxis through this one program to purchase a month of contraceptive care, they would work internationally uh, with an organization called Population Health to provide uh, contraceptive care to another woman in an underserved community outside of the United States. So I'm coming up on sort of my last slide. So all of this has been a very interesting journey for me. And I am now working at the Miss Porter School um, and I say it like that because it just makes me giggle. The school's been around since 1843, um, and Sarah Porter is the founder, and she is a woman who, back in 1843, was um, educated along with her brothers uh, through tutors, and one of her brothers ultimately became the president of Yale University in Connecticut. Um, and I've included our, um, our mission statement, which says we educate young women to become informed, bold, resourceful, and ethical global citizens. We expect our graduates to shape a changing world. So Ms. Porters um, contacted me this past summer uh, to serve as a consultant for them um, in the age of COVID. Uh, they had some um, transitions of staff because people needed to do other things with and for their families. But in the middle of all that, they were about to do a website launch. And with their chief communications officer transitioning out, um, and with my background in public health, knowing that they needed to return to school and develop a plan, uh, they really wanted somebody who could help them with those sorts of things. So um, I, I uh, was commissioned to come on board and I ultimately helped them launch the website. So I picked up this project in the middle. We actually first did a microsite to give us a little bit more time as I learned what was being done and what they were trying to do and how we could best execute that. So that middle image shows um, our new homepage uh, with knowing the audience. It is for um, 12, 13, and 14-year-old girls who may be considering private school or boarding school, and this is an all-girls school. Um, so we had to completely revamp the language, the images, and everything on the website to meet a new audience with the goal of getting them to do or not to do, getting them to apply or to inquire about admission to the school. Um, with my background in public health, I also, uh, helped work on the COVID uh, return to school plan. And I'm very pleased to share that um, one of the things that we're doing here at Ms. Porter's is we are doing mandatory testing of all faculty, staff, and students every week. Um, and we um, had to meet the Connecticut gating requirements for return to school. Um, as an institution, we've gone and exceeded those expectations. We had um, girls coming to the into campus or into Connecticut to week quarantine with a negative PCR test prior to arrival on campus. Once they got to campus, there was a two week on campus quarantine with another PCR test um, that we administered along with U University of Connecticut Healthcare. And to date, um, this is as of last week or two weeks ago, to date we have uh, done 1,544 COVID tests. We've tested 807 students, 737 faculty or staff, and we have a zero positive rate. Um, we test weekly on Thursdays so that if we get a positive test, then we can make sure that that girl is isolated or quarantined. Then um, her parents would come and get her and they, she would uh, do her convalescing or medical treatment at home. Um, but again, the, with the public health hat on, I've had lots of other and different types of responsibilities. 
Um, and it's very interesting because one of the things that has been a challenge was until we had the data to report, there was concerns that, well, why, why aren't they telling us anything? But we needed to wait until we had enough information that we could then develop a dashboard, which we're now reporting out weekly. So um, just wanted to share, that's a little bit of some of the things I've done over time. Um, and I just wanna follow up with just some ideas that um, have resonated with me over the course of my career and um, also with my now continued schooling is that uh, everything is not always academic. So uh, earlier I said, let's have some fun. I think that's a really important thing that in anything that you do, you're having fun. So if you're in an area and you're thinking, oh, well, you know, this is great, but it's not exactly what I wanna do. I'm not quite sure what's missing. Explore other opportunities because if you're not having fun, it's gonna make your day-to-day -day very, very difficult. Um, when I think of health communications, a lot of times we get bogged down with, you know, being perfect rather than being good. And I think a lot of times you just need to take a step back and remember what is the ultimate goal. And in health communications, it's getting your audience or your public to do or to not do something. I want you to stop smoking or I want you to put on your seatbelt. I don't want you to text while you drive, right? I want you to get a vaccine during flu season. Um, these are, it's very, very simple when you sort of break it down to its base elements. Um, this says in every health care, it should say in every healthcare space, um, there's always going to be a role for a communications professional. Um, so if this is something you think you're interested in, or it's giving you a pause to think about this in a little bit different way, I would love to have a conversation with you. And then practice makes professional because it's practice, 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 so you can sort of climb that ladder in whatever your chosen field is. So I'm going to open this back up and uh, I will share Here's all my contact information. I always encourage people to reach out because that's how you build your network. Um, and because you're all affiliated with Maria, you are by extension part of my network and I'm happy to communicate with anybody. Um, there's my Twitter handle. I tend to get a little bit political, just so you know. And uh, here's my LinkedIn contact, which I tend to not at all be political, just so you know. Are we opening up to questions now? So if you want to use your voice or use your uh, chat, either way, I'll be looking at the chat. So who's got questions? Quiet group. I'll stop my share. Ah. Gosh, I was just so amazing that nobody's got any questions. I know. Well, you did amazing. I have a question. Uh, you said you worked on the SARS vaccine, right? I did. Um, do you know anything about how the how that actually the vaccine actually stopped the SARS to SARS virus? Um, so actually, it wasn't necessarily mass distribution of the vaccine. Um, it was really eradication efforts that really did it. Um, and it is available. I'm not sure that it's mass commercially available, um, but really it was the mitigation efforts that sort of stopped the spread. So it was, you know, hand hygiene. Uh, it was um, face coverings to some degree, depending on where they were, what they knew. Um, if you remember, the one of the countries that was hit worst was, um, was Canada. And they have a um, executive uh, level of, uh, professionals who are actually trained in what they do and they have a government administration that listened to the science and they they worked with not only CDC but World Health Organization and other types of um, entities uh, nationally and internationally to really sort of um, tamp that down and um, when I was working on the SARS vaccine, I think that clinical trial we did phase one studies and so what I worked on at NIH were phase one studies first in humans. And then they usually tend to be very, very small. We might, we would occasionally do phase twos, but you do a phase one, very, very small, safety, 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 that's all we're looking at. Then you get a little bit larger to phase two to determine things like dosing or do you use a bioinjector versus a needle or, you know, those kinds of things to, do, to look at um, dispersal of the medication. And then from there, they would go to larger clinical trials. Um, but I do know, um, and it's been a couple of years, that was 2004, 2005, and that was 16 years ago. <laughs> so um, I do know that the core of that vaccine product 
is the core of this new one. Cool, thank you. Sure. So Ari is asking me what parts of my career are most overwhelming and which process is most enjoyable? Um, so I think sometimes the, the part that can be overwhelming is oftentimes when you get a lot of the questions back, right? Um, so there's sort of two phases. So, you know, when you're doing health comps, it's kind of like this, right? So you come up with the idea, you've got to do the research, you've got to get the analytics, and then you spend a large amount of your time developing your campaign, developing your proposal, developing your creative, and then you put everything out into the world, and then you wait, right? Um, I really enjoy creating order out of chaos. I'm a middle child. I'm the second of four. My life was always chaotic and crazy. My mom was a teacher, and Maria knows. Um, and so that is, um, I think, inherently a skill that I have, and I've used that to my advantage over the course of my career. Um, and that would be another thing I would say is work to your strengths, you know, and if you find out that you're struggling in one area and you're doing really great in another area, pivot. There is no harm in that, you know. Um, and for me, uh, thinking back a little bit about um, medical school, I could have gone but it wasn't, it, what I thought was gonna be fun was no longer fun. Um, so I think in terms of looking at my career, what's been most enjoyable has been creating the order out of chaos. So even like here at Miss Porter's, you know, I came in and they're like, we've got a website, it's supposed to launch in two weeks. And it's like, no, we're not, right? So I literally was like, that's not doable. You know, I, I'm a consultant, you've got one staff person, you know, we need to take a step back and figure out what makes the most amount of sense. And so part of what I needed to do was do an evaluation of all of their materials. What were they trying to do with the website? Who was the audience? Um, what resources did they have? And then make some decisions and recommendations. And based on that, we developed the microsite that went up for about, it was up for a month. We, we created a microsite in two weeks, including a video from the head of school. And all of this was in the midst of George Floyd and um, the pandemic was very, very high at the time. Um, that was the middle of June. So there were different states that were on lockdown and we had, and then the president came out with international students can't come back to the United States. And so that was a, like a big thing because for a lot of private schools and independent schools and colleges, a lot of your revenue comes from full paying international students. Um, so there were things like that that we had to do. Um, so I think that sometimes there's just a lot of information coming in that you have to process. And it's determining what is the most important thing to process right now? What's the priority right now? What is that piece that's gonna move you along that goal and sort of figuring what that is? Um, did anyone ever discourage you from pursuing your career? And if not, did you ever discourage yourself? Well, I will tell you, I'm a child of an educator and I, um, this is gonna sound really arrogant and I don't mean it to be, but I'm really smart and I had skipped a grade. So when I was a senior, I was like almost a year and a half younger than most of my classmates. I actually wanted to graduate as a junior. My mother told me I would have been too young. I would have been 15. Um, and so in terms of was I ever discouraged? No, I actually had the exact opposite that um, my mother and my father both are college educated. So I have that privilege of coming from a space of education. And um, I actually had the luxury of always knowing that if I wanted to take time off, I could. That was a true blessing. And I actually did. I did two years of college. I took a year off. I did a year of research down in Washington. Then I went back and finished up. Um, and part of that just year of discernment was, I'm not having fun over here. I can do this, but this isn't fun. I'm having fun in all of these classes. So I took a year off. I worked with some alum. I did a year of research at Children's Hospital in BC with a woman who had her MD, MPH. And so I was able to see the medical side versus the public health side. And that helped me help guide where I ultimately ended up going, which is firmly in the public health realm. Um, did I ever discourage myself? Um, I mean, I think we all have those moments, right? Where sometimes you're gonna doubt yourself. And I think especially as a woman in American society, we doubt ourselves. As a black woman in American society, I'm gonna doubt myself. But I think that um, I have a fairly robust ego, and so that didn't usually last too long. Um, when you discussed that they didn't have to consider sex when doing research, how did that impact their results in a negative way? So it doesn't necessarily impact the results. Oh, what I decided this is one day, this is the other day. Since we're giving it to start. There you go. Um, so it's not that it impacted the results in a negative way, it's that the results were inconclusive. 
right? So if it's inconclusive, they're not generalizable. So if you only have information on one, I mean, there's 330 million people in this country. You're only doing research on 115 million of them. And then we're gonna take that information and just say, it should work. Well, it doesn't. Women have different biology. We have different physiology. We have different hormone cycles. So to make the assumption, right, that something should work when it doesn't is pure fallacy. So really, you know, but if we think about the etiology of science and scientific research in this country, it was educated, rich, white men who have the opportunity and the financial resources to go to college. And so they focused on them, right? You tend to do research on people who look like you. So it's not a surprise, it's just an is. And this is one of those uh, efforts that was de developed to help change that. So actually Dr. Janine Clayton um, is an African-American woman. Uh, she is an MD out of Hopkins. Um, and she worked with Dr. Francis Collins, who's the very, very head head of National Institutes of Health. They worked on that policy initiative and it actually had to, I believe it had to be approved by Congress. Um, I like the point you made about sociocultural racial factors affect how African people need to public health concepts. <sighs> yeah. So basically this question looks at the injustices and atrocities on lots of vulnerable populations. And does that influence, influence or affect uh, people historically and currently in participating in clinical research? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I am right now having these conversations all the time with friends and families of friends and family. Um, just recently I had this conversation with my dad when I was home. He is a Vietnam vet, mid seventies, black man, overweight, diabetes. And he was like, I'm not taking that vaccine. And I was like, the hell you're not. Like if we get one, you're taking one, right? Like that's what you're gonna do. And quite honestly had reached out to my friends and I used to be like, do we have a study for old people? Because if we do, I got two black ones. I know you're gonna need them because you have a mandate to have 30% of your clinical trials like diverse. So let me know. Um, and then I told my father, and if we get into one, you're going, like that's what you're gonna do. These are very real conversations that we have to have. I think the good news is that um, there have been atrocities levied against women, um, prisoners, people in the military, like vulnerable populations doesn't only include of color. Um, you have children, historically, people did research on children without consent or assent. Um, but there's lots of initiatives in place. You've got the Belmont Review, you've got community advisory boards, you have um, institutional review boards or IRBs. Um, so there are so many mechanisms in place, I think right now um, to ensure that those types of things don't happen again. Um, in particular, uh, and this is not to be political, again, it's an is, I think when there are people touting we'll have a vaccine by the state, which is not scientifically accurate or sound. The very fact that the pharmaceutical companies came out in mass to say, hold on, chill over there. We will only put out a vaccine when the science says that we will. That was really, really, really a hugely monumental thing. I don't think people understand what a big deal that was. Um, so what I do with regards to this sort of thing is when I hear people complaining or bringing up things from 50, 60, 80 years ago, which is real, which affects people's willingness to participate. Um, I take the knowledge that I have and I explain the research. I just did this on Saturday with some friends of mine. And I sat down, I'm like, let me tell you why I would trust the science. Let me tell you the places that I would go. Let me tell you why you can do this. Let me tell you what you should look at if you're looking to be in a clinical trial. Um, so what I do is I take the time, even if I don't have it, to explain that process. Um, but we have a lot of work to do in general to make sure that we can have clinical trials that are representative of lots of different types of people. Um, when I was at NIH, I mentioned that we launched a mobile clinic. And part of that was because we have a lot of Hispanics and Latinos who many are undocumented, many who only speak Spanish as their primary language. And NIH is a federal facility. You go through a gate and you show an ID to get there. Excuse me, by eliminating that barrier, again, thinking health communication, health literacy, bringing the resources to the people, by having a mobile clinic that left the grounds, that opened up the entire community and our clinical trial participation by Hispanics, Latinos, and Spanish as a first language increased by about 25%, which was significant when you have zero. Okay, I'm going to um, pause because I know we are a little over time. Um, so I'm going to pause here and I want us all to thank our speaker and I will allow, Diane, how, do you have five more minutes? 
if, sure. if you have questions. So I'm going to allow people to linger, but first let's, um, let's thank her in whatever virtual way we do. Um, there's a little clappy button somewhere, but I can't find it now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, my classes were doing like the jazzy. Like, yeah, Ooh. there we go. It sounds like, like, uh, sign language. Okay. So um, again, thank you, Diane. We appreciate this. And um, you're getting lots of thanks there in the chat. And I'm going to let people just sort of filter out. And if a few of you have a few questions that you didn't get answered and really would like to, um, you can hang out for just a little longer. We see people slowly disappearing. There we go. Now my mouse is there. All right, we're down to just a handful. A few. Ernesto. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> That's my chair down there, Dr. Bay. He's a statistician, so. Dr. Jeff? Bay? Yeah, thank you, Diane. That was very interesting. Hi. The students thank you. To nice to meet you. It, so we appreciate you. That's great. I'm glad. I was expecting you were going to ask about stats, Jeff. Yeah, well, I sent it. It was kind of a, a late uh, email, but sent an email to my stats class is recommending this. And there are a couple students I have, a few students that I have in class. Now, I don't know if it's because of the email or not, but uh, but yeah. Um, to health comms is a great place for stats people because they got to crunch all the numbers for us. Yeah. You know, that, that's yeah. where our insights come from. When I was at um, Ketchum PR, we had an entire research development team. And all they do, we'd give them the question and their job was to pull all the research and give us sort of the key findings. Um, it's yeah. really good work. And they get to yeah. get a really good chunk of change, honestly. Like some of our junior people, like right out of college, making 50, 60, $70,000 a year, at least here in DC. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to do that, but yeah, it's important stuff. Mackenzie, did you wanna ask a question? I see you've turned your camera on. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question. So. I um, have been thinking a lot about my potential career options lately, and mm -hmm. I have a passion for arts and writing and like literature. And I was wondering in your career, okay. it seems like there are a bit of like arts with like your posters and all that jazz. Absolutely. Can you like um, speak more to how exactly the fine arts are included in your career? Um, all of our creative team. Everybody on our creative team, our digital, our regular creative team, it's all artists, graphics, graphic designers. Um, we, one of the campaigns I worked on, I, I showed you the, um, the kids in the Truancy campaign. Um, that is a guy by the name of Jerry Kraft. You can look him up. He uh, was a comic book artist who branched out on his own and now writes his own children's books. And he's got his own comic strip. Um, and so he, he'll work with people like me, you know, our thing to him was, you know, we're working in an urban environment. Um, and his, his, uh, his characters are called mama's boys. And it's these two brothers who are raised by a single mother in New York. Um, and he literally interviewed these kids and then developed those ads completely around them. So there's lots of different ways, I think, that if you're into art, art history, art literature, art, you know, that you could find an opportunity in a career, but absolutely with any of the creative shops. So um, you might want to look at public relations um, companies or design companies, ad agencies. Um, all of those groups tend to pay a little bit more than some of the other places. Um, again, if you're in a city like DC, I mean, you know, our junior designers make really, really decent money. Um, I'm not sure what your sort of InDesign skills are or your publisher skills or even designing on web, um, but those might be some skills that you'd want to uh, maybe learn about or hone or take some classes on, but comp absolutely in the digital space. Just um, today for where I am now at Miss Porter's, we've got to develop our holiday card. Now it's not rocket science, but you know, we use the main image of our building and we animate it. And we have a local artist who literally came and did a rendering. He, um, his daughter is graduate here. He and his wife are both artists. And he sent me his whole portfolio. So he's done all these sketches of all these buildings. And then he took one of those. He uh, did all the painting for it. And then he digitized it. That's so and he's, a, he's, he's, he's an artist. Like he does shows like that's He's an artist, but he's, he's worked for Sesame Street. He's worked for PBS. 
um, and he does his own like portraits and things like that. So I think there's lots of opportunities. You just need to be open, I think, to not being so linear. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. Don't be linear. Think outside the box. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Cool. Are we Matthew was putting on some shoes. Matthew says he's putting on his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Matthew is, is hanging out. Um, but I think, uh, Matthew, did you have a question? Um, hanging. Well, like, yeah, I, th I think I do. Um, so like, I'm currently in the um, pre-veterinary track for school, okay. mm -hmm. but I feel like I'm not exactly um, the type, I like, like I do well in my biology class and looking at papers and understanding studies isn't, it isn't hard, that hard for me, but mm -hmm. I'm, I don't really, for lack of a better word, uh, jive or vibe with like chemistry stuff mm -hmm. and in hearing about you talk about your kind of work um it, it feels a bit more uh, again without a better word a uh, familiar i guess mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what what could be some stuff i could like look up to try and see more about this sort of field of like science communications so, um, so absolutely, I think that's great. Um, you could be a science writer. There's lots of space there. I've got another very good friend of mine who, um, when I was working at NIH this second time, we commissioned him as a science writer because, you know, a lot of those researchers do do their own scholarly research, but a lot of them don't. Like, it's their lab and it's their junior staffers who write it up and then they review, edit, or they hire a science writer and things like that. Um, so you, science writing is certainly something to look into. Um, I'd mentioned, you know, working at an agency, we have whole shops of researchers who do nothing but research, review, write, copy. Um, and they might write the, the scientific findings and the, again, they might fill that down. Um, thinking veterinary, don't forget that even the pharmaceutical companies, right? The pharmaceutical companies do a lot of research on, with animal science. Um, and there are a couple of them that primarily do, um, I'm thinking, uh, one of the pharma companies that starts with a Z, and I'm blanking on the name, but if you um, were to Google um, pharmaceutical companies, animal science, there would be all kinds of things that come up. And when I'm saying animal science, I'm not necessarily saying uh, research on animals, although there is that, but there's also people who are doing um, animal science for animals, right? So like looking at what medications, I and mean, we get medications for animals too, because somebody's doing that bench work. Uh, somebody's doing that research. Somebody's writing up those publications. Somebody's translating that science to a regular person. Somebody's writing copy for a website for, you know, fosters and science and all of these other kinds of um, web-based platforms to learn about animals. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's lots of, of opportunity uh, again, I'll share with you what I said to Mackenzie, be flexible, be willing to think outside the box and just don't stay so linear to, I've got to be a veterinarian. Um, and not that you couldn't, couldn't or you shouldn't or don't, um, but if you're finding that that's not where your passion lies, sort of figure out what it is that, again, brings you joy. Life is too short to be miserable at work. We spend way too many hours a week here. And um, Matthew, Dr. Gibson used to be um, a scientific editor. So talk to her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice to yeah. meet you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, I guess that, yeah, that, that answers my question. I'll, I'll look into that sort of thing. Great. And again, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to put you in touch. My friend that I'm thinking about in particular, his name is Al Starafoli. Um, and if you Google him, I'll put his name into the chat. Is it Alistair? It's She's Al Starafoli. And oh, the okay. name of his company, let me see. He's a science writer, a Harvard trained science writer, as a matter of fact. Um, his name, the name of this company is Medical Communications and Marketing. And he's, he's out of Florida. Communications and marketing, okay. Got that and I, I threw that into the chat for you. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think that's that's all I had. I think I'm gonna okay. go eat lunch now. 
I didn't have breakfast either, so I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming today. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks again. No Mackenzie. problem. Thanks for coming. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye. Bye bye. You converted everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That was Excellent. awesome. Yeah. I love, you know, just that, that was perfect. You know, here are some of the things that I worked on. Perfect. You know. Oh, good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, not, I didn't realize I was going over. You should have. Me it was you didn't go over the questions started to go over and, oh okay and, and just because we we have we have chapel today that starts at like 120 and there's like a hard rule about not scheduling things over chapel it's not a requirement to go but um what it used to be it used to be there used to be daily chapel here in the 60s and they that and so i think one of the compromises was to to carve out a time of day for chapel and and that's sort of the time and you're not allowed to so officially we we have to say okay you know you go um and then that's why i said if people want to hang out right so yeah awesome well thank you i would love to see you in person Excellent. one of these days of course this was so much fun <laughs> i know i almost called you're still recording by the way i know i um, just realized